but I promised to start on time, so I will. Welcome to this evening's conversation about how we can make political campaigns more ethical. Before we get into it, a couple of quick logistics. The first thing to note is that tonight's conversation is being recorded. The only people who will appear on the video are those who are speaking. So if you don't want your friends or family to know that you attended an event about ethics, no worries. Your secret is safe with us. Uh, I'm going to post the video in a couple of days, clean it up a little bit, put it up online, and I'll email a link to the video to, to everybody who's registered for the event. So if you miss part of it or you want to catch up or share it, uh, it'll be easy to do that. Uh, you'll also note that everybody's muted, but the chat is open. Please throw ideas or questions into the chat. We'll try to keep track of that as we go, try to ask questions or get to them as we can. All right, so with that, let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, my name is Peter Loge. I'm the director of the Project on Ethics and Political Communication and an associate professor at the, in the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University and a strategic consultant. I've spent more than 25 years on the, the uh, politics side of the equation, working on campaigns, candidates on the Hill and the administration, I'm doing some adjunct professing. Since the fall of 2017, I've been a member of the full-time faculty in George Washington University, and I still do some political advising on the side. Uh, I launched the, the project on ethics and political communication a couple of years ago uh, to promote the study, practice, and teaching of ethics and political communication. Seems like, seems like it should be a thing. It turns out that you know, if you study uh, journalism, law, business, public relations, medicine, any number of other fields, you're exposed to ethics. You have to take courses in ethics. There are textbooks, journals, conferences, entire ethics infrastructures. More and more students are majoring in political communication at places like the George Washington University, Emerson College, soon to be Shepherd University and others. There are graduate degrees, minors, certificates and courses and more in political communication, but remarkably little about the ethics of this specific little niche, this specific little subfield. So at the project, we're trying to change that. We're doing it through a couple of different ways. Uh, one is we're hosting, uh, I give a lot of talks around the country. I've talked to colleges and universities, conferences, lobbying firms, consulting firms, organizations. Earlier today, thanks to the magic of Zoom, I spoke at the University of Florida. I taught my class on ethics and political communication in DC. And our guest speaker was David Welch, who's with us this evening, who's at the Stubblefield Institute at Shepherd University. Um, so lots of that kind of stuff. Would love to talk to you and your group. If, if that's something you're interested in, let me know. We host conversations like this. We've hosted them in person. Remember in person? I miss in person. We've had video and in-person conversations with speech writers from, uh, the, from the Bush and Clinton administrations, leading award-winning journalists, advocates. We've had online conversations with people, including former Agriculture Secretary Dan Glickman, um, a leading rhetorical scholar named Mark McPhail. We had one of, one of the most interesting conversations we had last summer was with a candidate for the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors and Dan Hazelwood's adopted state of Arizona and a philosophy professor here at GW talking about the real theory and practice of what it means to run, run an ethical campaign in a really competitive heated year. We've written articles for publications like Campaigns and Elections, The Hill, Media Ethics, uh, Fulcrum, and others. Um, we've hosted digital conversations where people chat back and forth, including with Sarah Isger, who's a former public affairs director for then uh, Attorney General Sessions, and Mo Elithy, who's now at Georgetown University and used to be the spokesperson for the Democratic National Committee. Another one we hosted was with the heads of the college Republicans and college Democrats here at GW, who back when we were all allowed to be together, actually share an office. I think there's something probably to be learned from that. We produce a series of case studies with the University of Texas Austin Media Ethics Initiative. Uh, we've got about a half a dozen of these so far. They're two, three pages long, ready for classroom distribution, ripped from the headline stuff, about topics like uh, campaign promises, lobbying, issue framing, and more. Um, We've uh, gotten a fair amount of press uh, in, in print media. Journalists in the 2020 cycle called me for my take on the ethics of various campaigns. We've been interviewed on podcasts, on radio, and elsewhere. And in addition, last summer, Roman and Littlefield published a, a first of its kind textbook called Political Communication Ethics Theory and Practice. Half the chapters were from academics, some of whom are with us this evening, writing about everything from Isocrates and Aristotle up through digital ethics and speech writing. The other half are by a bipartisan group of political practitioners, speech writers, digital advocates, um, former opposition researcher who was on the Rubio campaign and others writing about you know, what the day-to-day -day ethics of, of politics looks like. You know, it's Tuesday morning at 10, you're in a staff meeting. It's uh, five days out from a competitive race. How are the ethical decisions actually getting made? 
So we think we're doing pretty good. We think we're doing, we think we're doing pretty well. And this is our official second birthday, second anniversary event. Um, it feels like appropriate that American politics is in the terrible twos at this point. The other thing that we've discovered is also, we haven't discovered, everybody agrees everybody else ought to be more ethical, right? Everybody thinks, of course, you need more ethics. I'm fine. It's all of you people who are the problem. And if I'm doing something bad, it's only because you're doing something bad and I have to compensate. And a question that often comes up is why be ethical? How do we make campaigns more ethical? So we thought we would ask the people who run the campaigns. Now, as a lot of you registered for this event, uh, I asked you to put in questions or comments as you registered and a lot of people did. Thank you very much for that. We'll try to get to those this evening, uh, probably in bunches. They tended to fall into, into categories of, of topics. Uh, and also stay tuned for future events. When I send a follow-up email, I'll send you a link to sign up for, for emails from us and um, how to follow us on Twitter to get, the, to get the updates. We'll try to get to those topics. We'll see what we can do. Can't get to them all tonight. We'll try to address them in, in future events. Also throw stuff in, in the chat if you want. Again, we'll try to get to that, try to make it as interactive as we can. So with that, the question of how do we make campaigns more ethical, I'm gonna to put to, uh, to the people, to America's leading campaign consultants and a student who's gonna look at them probably somewhat skeptically. I'm gonna introduce them in order in which they will speak. Then we're just gonna dive on into the conversation. And I promise I'll have you out of here by 7 p.m. Eastern time. First person with us this evening is uh, Rose Kapolchinsky, who's the president of the American Association of Political Consultants. I'm just reading her bio verbatim, which is why I'm looking down, not at, not at you nice people. She's a veteran campaign and communication strategist, best known for running all four former California Senator Barbara Boxer's campaigns. Her consulting firm has helped more than 100 candidates and organizations advance creative, disciplined, and persuasive campaigns. In addition to her political campaign experience, Rose spent two decades working inside government and advocacy organizations, developing special expertise in message development, influencing news coverage, and directing rapid response operations. She's been interviewed for hundreds of international, national, and local news stories. Rose started her career as an environmental organizer at the University of Colorado Wilderness Study Group and the Sierra Club, and she volunteers as a mentor to women candidates through Emerge California. Joining Rose this evening is Dan Hazelwood. Dan is a leading Republican political consultant who's a member of the uh, Ethics Committee for the American Association of Political Consultants. And I can tell you from our conversations, he is serious and committed to the topic. Uh, Dan has spent, who specializes in uh, voter main advertising and campaign strategy. He founded his company Targeted Creative Communications Incorporated, known as TC Squared in 1993. His clients have included over 100 congressmen, senators, and governors, various Republican National Party committees, the George W. Bush and Bob Dole presidential campaigns, and former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. He formerly ran the Republican National Committee Campaign Management College and is an outspoken consultant on the need for ethics and political campaigns. Finally, this evening, we have with us Sydney Register, an undergraduate here at the George Washington University, one of the few, if not only people, to major in political communication and minor in applied ethics, something I think more people probably ought to be doing. Um, Sydney uh, is a student athlete, a member of the sailing team here at GW, and is a host of a political satire show. Uh, she was a student of mine in the fall and is a student in, in the course I teach this semester on ethics and political communication. I'm going to moderate the discussion, throw the questions to them, push and pull where I can, and we're just going to see how this goes. So without objection, and all of your videos are off, so I'm going to assume you're just nodding in agreement. I want to start, Rose, with you. Uh, Rose, I am looking at, um, if, you look at, if you go to the AAPC website and you look at the about, the first thing you see is a statement that says, founded in 1969, the AAPC is a multipartisan organization of political and public affairs professionals dedicated to improving democracy. I think if he said to most Americans, the goal of political consultants is to improve democracy, they might be somewhat skeptical. Um, how do you do that? What do you mean? How do you envision this? Well, political consultants are on the front lines of democracy. Uh, just think about it, in a presidential campaign year, Every adult American consumes our work uh, online, on TV, in their mailbox, even into their personal phone, um, whether they vote or not. Um, and our work, the, the content and the tone of our work uh, influences those people uh, and changes their attitudes about candidates and issues. I mean, that's our job. Uh, but it also influences how they feel about the country and about democracy. Um, 
long, long ago when Dan and I were first uh, getting involved in politics, um, the press provided powerful guardrails against false, illegal, or unethical behavior. I mean, if you engaged in it and you got caught, you paid a very high price uh, through negative coverage, editorials, and that's because the press was respected then as a neutral arbiter of, uh, of the truth and, uh, and what was ethical. Um, but now those guardrails are gone um, or disappearing. And uh, that means we all need to do more. At AAPC, we've adopted a code of ethics. Uh, we ask every member to pledge to abide by that code of ethics. Uh, we've added ethics as a criteria in our annual Polly's Award, uh, where we honor the best ads and mail and, and campaigns of the year. Um, and we're doing more webinars and we're speaking on more panels like this. Um, so more than anything, I think we just need to elevate ethics in the political conversation so that everyone's thinking about it as they consume uh, those ads on TV and uh, what ends up in their mailbox. Makes sense. Dan, you're the ethics guy, the AAPC. And I have to say, I, I went back to the website again, went to the AAPC website. And if you look at the code of ethics, the first thing that shows up before you get to the code says there's a commitment to ethical business practices. Um, and I have to say, if people look askance at political consultants improving democracy, they would look at political communication ethics and giggle. There's actually, there are very few books written about political communication ethics. If you Google them, one of them pops up is political communication ethics, an oxymoron. But I know you're committed to it. We've talked about it. And in the code, there are several points that speak specifically to ethics. What are political communication ethics to you? Well, I think there's a whole lot of pieces here. And the part of how we built the code and how what we're trying to do with the AAPC and also just in, in other aspects is make sure people start thinking about this. The problem I see it is, is that everybody always wants this Hollywood version of this ethical dilemma where, you know, Frodo is at Mount Doom holding the ring and does he throw it in? And that's great cinema, but that's not the real world. There's no political consultant. There's no campaign manager out there saying, do I want to be a Jedi Knight or a Sith Lord? No one chooses to be evil. Um, the reality is much more mundane because it is much more mundane. It is much more dangerous because uh, the slippery slope, which you can argue whether that's a good way to look at the world or not, but, but there's all these decisions you make, all these instances that actually have huge ethical implications. And the truth is, and, and this is a guffaw line for many people, but consultants really do consider the ethics of what they do a lot. Now, the question is, are they thinking it through the lens of, is this ethical or how I should do this? Because when consultants put together ads, we are like, how do I make this ad correct? And part of that is, you know, all the things we, we will talk about here, but, but there's an ethical component of that. Um, we talk at the APC, and I think it's important, the money in politics. Look, money and, and, and power have always been corrupting influences since at least the book of Exodus, if not Genesis. Um, the reality though, is there's so much money. We have people who are under the age of 25 managing million or multi-million dollar campaigns. And how do you, and, and just like, that's just a lot of responsibility in what you do. And then there's also the relationships from consultants to consultants. And, you know, I find myself and uh, I speak up about ethics and it's sort of like you're in one of those mob movies and they're talking about, you know, hey, let's go whack Frankie. And if someone, if one of the mobsters says, maybe we shouldn't, everybody looks at you like, what's wrong with you? And that's a little bit of the danger that people feel of talking about ethics, which is one of the reasons why I keep trying to drag it out into, into, into campaigns because people ought to feel comfortable of saying, let's not do that. And then they don't get punished even, you know, business-wise. And so there's a lot of pieces in that because at the end of the day, and we're going to talk about ethics and definitions, but part of the definition of ethics is what do you do when no one is watching? And that's kind of where we are and, 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 and what we need to think about. So all those reasons, I think we need to drag it out and talk about it a lot more. 
Well, before before we get to Sydney for her response to this, let's ask that question, right? A lot of people, when they registered for the event, said, I'd like to know how people define ethics. What is ethics? What do political consultants consider ethics? Dan, Rose, what are political campaign ethics? <laughs> this this is the question. This, this, this is something that we struggle with every time we, we, we go out. So this is why we built the code of ethics to start building out principles much like the famous Supreme Court decisions, you know, the variation is, I know unethical behavior when I see it, but it's very hard to define in a proactive sense. But there's pieces and that's what our code of ethics and encourage everybody, the aapc.org is our website uh, about us as the code of ethics section, go to it. You look at it, they're broad parameters. Um, we're trying to aspire to something more than don't break the law. That's, that's a good baseline, but we wanna try and push it up there. But you know, what are you doing that's right when no one's paying attention is a good place to start. Rose, is that, does that make sense to you that about your experience as well? Uh, sure, it does start with uh, don't break the law. Um, uh, and again, many people are thrown into campaigns um, or they're thrown into decision-making about a part of a campaign that they don't really know the legal underpinning. Um, you know, every campaign of any size should have an attorney advising them. Uh, in my campaigns, every ad, every piece of mail, uh, every major thing we're doing gets run by the attorney. Um, and occasionally they come back and say, is this really true? Or, uh, you know, aren't you really stretching things here? You know, is this really ethical. Um, I think telling the truth is a baseline, um, having validation for what you're saying so that you can prove that you're telling the truth um, and, and that you're not uh, uh, trying to uh, fan the flames of hate toward any group um, uh, and, uh, and that you're, you're not trying to discourage people from voting either. I mean, we're about democracy. Democracy depends on voting. Um, exactly how we vote is a matter of debate in our bipartisan organization. Um, but, uh, you know, voter suppression is not uh, pro-democracy and I, I think is not ethical. Did you even listen here? Sorry, sorry. Go, 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 please. <laughs> the slippery slope begins where we all want that lawyer to look at stuff, but the lawyers start to look at it and say, is this libelous? And if it's an independent expenditure, is it technically true enough so it doesn't get knocked off TV by the TV station? And so what's happened is, is what pe began with people kind of thinking, oh, bringing the lawyers, bringing ethics. That's not what, that's not what happened. What happened was everybody became focused on technically complying which brought down in many ways the, why are we worried about ethics when we're focused on technically complying? So these are the kind, and this is why I say it's a mundane thing that we get into all the time. Well, but, it should be a floor, not a ceiling, Dan. How about that? All right, so, so Sydney's been patiently waiting um, and, and take, I've seen her taking notes diligently and I know she thinks hard about this. Sydney, what do you, what do you think of what you've heard so far? Well, first of all, I want to preface with saying I have not been a political consultant yet. <laughs> I am still a student. So I have a bit more of an idealistic, maybe even more cynical view than those who have been in the field for a while. But I think that what both Dan and Rose are saying speaks to a larger systematic problem where behavior that only meets that minimum criteria of I'm not breaking the law is incentivized and the repercussions of that behavior has no consequence. We saw this with the Trump administration. Um, I hate to use Trump as the only example. Um, you can go back to Willie Horton. I mean, there's Newt Gingrich. There's lots of examples that we could use, but overall, there's a problem with incentivizing behavior within the political system. And I thought that Rose brought up a really good point about wh what do we base political communication ethics in? Do we base it in truth? Do we base it in not breaking the law? 
we've already identified that breaking the law isn't a high enough bar. The law is there as a minimum standard. But I also wanna bring up the opinion that truth is not universal right now because we don't have those barriers. We don't have the third party watchdogs. We don't have a universal standard of what truth is for people. So when we're making decisions, uh, Professor Lodge outlined this in a class once and it made a whole lot of sense to me. In a democracy, we want to, first of all, get people to engage in the democratic process. Second of all, we want them to agree on the problems that we're engaging with within that process. But the issues come around in the third step when we try and determine how to solve those problems. And what Dan was saying before, political consultants interact with ethical decisions every single day, but it matters what lens they're using to view the solution to those problems. And right now there's a lot of finger pointing going on. Um, I actually had a classmate today point out that the Biden administration ran a campaign that was based around unity and civility and, and res mutual respect for each other, which was something that we hadn't seen for a while. But as to Ruth's point about we have to speak truth, the Biden campaign did not speak everybody's truth in this nation. It was a truth of the majority, but it was not everybody's truth. And so I feel like we have to be very careful about the bubble that we're speaking in, because sometimes that bubble can get a little bit too hard and it doesn't pop. All right, so I, I'm, I'm left with a couple of questions here. We've got a lot going on and, and um, it may help to ground this conversation a bit in some, in some specifics. And one of the um, things that, that Dan talked about, I think that Sydney got it and Rose got it a bit is, is the role of money, right? We all behave our incentives. Um, I've never been paid to lose nobly. I've always been paid to win. And winning tends to breed nobility, right? So how one of the incentives in, in politics is money. Um, and a number of people asked about this in, when, when they signed up for the event. You've got independent expenditures. You've got dark money groups. You've got PACs. You've got campaign contributions. Um, how do what is the role of money in distorting ethics and then how can we create a does does it does money create incentives to behave more or less ethically um dan what do you why don't you give it a shot and then we'll turn over to rose and once again go to city well, we, reality check we sort of assume as a culture that money can uh influence people's behavior and and greed is a is a part of human nature so obviously the money's around the point the the interesting point is it's not what I'd say is the pop culture per, perception of how money drives politics is actually not that accurate and how money operates in the political consulting sphere is not that linked. I mean, one of the things that sort of works is most political consultants in the United States are aligned with one party or another nearly exclusively. And if they're not, they're aligned with some cause that's very defined with an us and them. And you rarely can get people who will take money to cross over to the other line. So it's a little bit of the old West where are you there to fight for the sheep farmers or the cattle ranchers? You don't cross over. And so it, it doesn't quite affect money the way people talk about it in the world. Money has a lot of impact, though. So how, how does it, Rose, what's your, what's your take on this? I know you've run campaigns in California. I've run campaigns in California. It is blindingly expensive. What's the role of money in, in the, what's the relationship between money and ethics and campaigns from your perspective? Well, I've seen some very local uh, inexpensive campaigns with lousy ethics uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, violating norms of behavior, um, partly because there's so little scrutiny on the local level as uh, local newspapers fall by the way and uh, uh, blogs and online publications haven't really caught up. Um, uh, they don't have enough reporters to go follow these campaigns and the uh, filings that are only done on paper in many small towns uh, in, in California and elsewhere um, 
so uh, I don't think money uh, itself, I don't think a more expensive campaign is more likely to have questionable ethics. Um, uh, but money in politics um, uh, means more money for communications and more campaigns can afford uh, to do digital ads, which are inexpensive um, at the local level. And so there is, there is more political communication because there's more money. And that means there's more chance uh, that people who are either clueless or uh, ready to win at any cost um, uh, produce unethical material. So I, I want to push on this a little bit. Um, I want to get to the more money for digital ads. I definitely want to talk about the digital piece a bit later in the conversation because a lot of people are concerned about that. But let's talk about the money for a minute. Uh, you've both talked about um, uh, individual campaigns, right? Senator Boxer or Senator Kyle, who uh, Dan Hazel would help cost me a job in the early 90s in Arizona, it turns out. Uh, but what about other groups? Out, You've got outside groups, independent expenditures, uh, people sort of you make up an organization and you can send out whatever mail you want. What, what's is that money less ethical or do groups like that lead to less, less ethical campaigning? What's that relationship like? I think probably for the purposes of this conversation, I would say, yes, you have to say that that the McCain Feingold Bikra bipartisan campaign reform act that drove masses of money. Uh, combined with the Citizens United decision, but Bikra was the start of it, drove masses of money away from candidates and, uh, and, and drove that money to groups that don't have a candidate saying, I have to live in this community. I mean, I was in a, I, I've been in campaigns countless times where a candidate has said, we will not talk about X because I go to, I, you know, in South Dakota it was, I'm in supper club with that person. In New Jersey, it was, I see those people at the Rotary Club. There's a certain level of the candidates having the ability to pull things back. And, and we all have experiences with candidates being the ones pushing things forward. But, but without, the, without that person, then the independent groups are purely, how can I apply this new brute force of this ad campaign driven or volunteer or, or, or body campaign, brute force to affect this election outcome purely for the cause. And that is, so it's by, almost by definition, un, much less tethered to a candidate's ethics. I totally agree with that. Um, and I too have seen candidates many times saying, no, that's personal. It's not related to their work. We're not touching it. Um, uh, another candidate might have a completely different a reaction, but candidates not only have to live in the community, they have a long career ahead of them and uh, they, they have a reputation they care about. Um, so I do agree, IE committees don't care at all about their reputation, they just want to win. But, you know, that's, that's the result of, of uh, BICRA and Citizens United. So, Sydney, you've only ever grown up in a political world in which Russ Feingold campaign finance for sort of the law of the land, and you largely came politically aware you know, under Citizens United. Um, how do you see this debate about candidates spending their own money, then outside independent groups spending independent expenditures or other groups spending money to influence these campaigns? I feel like, well, I wasn't around, but before when this whole entire realm of campaign finance was not as divided and it didn't have such a spotlight on it. Um, because there wasn't a spotlight on it, the ethics were kind of, sure this happens, sure that happens, but we get into office and we make the change that we think we wanna have. But now that there's such a strong focus on where the money comes from, I mean, we've seen, countless books published, countless interviews had, I mean, Supreme Court cases, it's become a really large topic in the United States. And 
from my experience after Citizens United, um, the way that candidates raise money, it's almost like the candidate is what Rose and Dan were saying, completely separate from the finances of their campaign. When I donate to a campaign, I am almost never donating directly through that candidate. I'm donating through Act Blue, or I'm donating through separate organizations that are under the umbrella of the candidate. And well, I mean, personally, I've seen this in South Carolina, which is my home state, with the election between Lindsey Graham and Jamie Harrison. In the end of that election season, Jamie Harrison had a lot of money. Uh, he had a lot of money. Um, and Lindsey Graham still came out on top for multiple reasons that we won't get into, but Lindsey Graham still came out on top. So I also think that not only is there a disconnect between the candidate's ethics and where the money is coming from, but the impact that somebody's money has in a campaign in the first place. Uh, we've, I've grown up and I know that my peers have grown up thinking if you give money, the money's going to help. But when you've run such a large campaign at some points, I don't know, Rose and Dan, please speak to this because I have no earthly idea, but is there a, a point where the, the fundraising sort of goes beyond the necessity of the campaign? Is there ever a point like that? Yeah, I mean, so, so I think that you have like a couple of good points. First of all, yeah, this year we saw a number of campaigns that had more money than the ability to spend it vaguely competently. I mean, uh, by the way, just a tip for everybody, uh, if, if you sign up for Pandora and you, you can set your own zip code and Pandora targets you by where you claim you are, not where you actually are, you can connect to any state and you can listen to independent expenditure ads that are being run there. And who's actually being reached by those is an interesting question for the Pandora marketing department. But it's a great way to like, that's how much money people are chasing 500 people in a niche in a state of several million people. The interesting point about how money is changing, candidates in some way really, we've gone from this era where we have this very uh, wild west, meaning any, people can donate and find candidates and put money into candidates all over America. And it used to be, and, and, and Rose and I can tell many stories, one of the first things you did when a candidate is you went and you met with the local money people. And if they didn't want you, you didn't run. I mean, here in Arizona, there was a group of people who were well off who helped recruit Barry Goldwater to run for Congress and transformed America. Um, nowadays, a lot of candidates just say, I'm not, I don't like those people. I'm not gonna meet with them. They're the establishment or they're the, they're the ideologues, whatever the particular critique is. And they're gonna go straight to the internet. They're gonna pop up something on the video and they're gonna hope to hit a home run and they become untethered, right? And so part of this is really good because people who would never have the ability to break through now have the ability to break through. The problem is some of us really dislike those people who've broken through. And so again, one of the major dangers, and this is sort of my complaint against legislation, you would think these politicians know how to write a law that affects how they get elected but they're actually very bad at writing that law because the law of unintended consequences crushes them every time. As I say, political campaigns are an incredibly evolutionary activity. In the United States, we're an evolutionary species and we move at a frightening evolutionary rate. So whatever law comes in, there's gonna be the workarounds that start to take effect instantly. Rose, is that your experience? Yeah, I agree with that pretty much. All right, so money, outside money, potentially bad, way too much money. And I'm guilty of throwing money at races where I knew it didn't do anything, but it made me feel better. I'm absolutely guilty of that. What uh, The point of this conversation is how we solve the problem. So how do we solve that problem? <laughs> Thoughts, Dan, Rose? Sydney, do you have ideas? Well, I think ethics is a really um, tough, uh, question in this field. Um, we're not the Bar Association and we can't sanction a lawyer and uh, sanction a political consultant uh, and uh, 
we aren't a licensing organization. Um, and there are many um, consultants and, and some of the least ethical among them um, who aren't members of our organization and uh, don't want to be lectured about ethics. Um, uh, but I think, uh, I think elevating the conversation, um, educating candidates. Um, there are a lot of campaign schools um, for candidates. Um, and uh, in my experience, they rarely talk about ethics. They do talk about the law and, and complying with the law. Um, I don't know, Dan, you said you've done RNC campaign schools. Um, did you always have ethics in there for the candidates? Because candidates tend to see consultants as experts. And so um, if you're turning to your consultant and he or she cares about ethics, then you're gonna get ethical advice about whether you should do something. Uh, if, if that consultant doesn't care about ethics or just doesn't know, uh, you could get sent the wrong way. But um, Dan, what's your experience with, with campaign schools? Well, just as a technical matter, I tended to run the schools that were for staff, not the schools that were for candidates, although I spoke of them. So, but it's a great question. So equipping candidates with the ability to ask questions and where to go is an important part. And one of the one of the catches in the system is what candidates currently do. And so this kind of good, this is what I mean by there's these ethic thing, ethics things out here that we encounter that aren't what we talk about. So a candidate has a question. They're being told to hire a consultant. The consultant's giving them strange advice or fee structures. Who does that candidate turn to? The candidate's going to turn to either somebody who's run before, maybe somebody in the political party structure that they're aligned with, or some other activist. But what ha what's happened, and what, one of the things I talk about is we are all in tribes, right? That we talk about the tribalism in politics, where there's tribalism in networks and consultants. So if somebody asks me, hey, look at Rose's contract, and obviously it doesn't happen because she's a Democrat and I'm a, I'm a Republican, but say, hey, look at Rose's contract. Does this seem kosher to you? I'm going to say, yeah, that, I mean, I might, raise my eyebrows and say, well, I gotta raise my fees, but I'm, I'm unlikely because I'm friends with Rose to be biting in any critique I give. So the problem is candidates are turning to people who either have a implicit bias against the consultant they're hiring because they're looking to hire an insider or outsider depending on the dynamics or in a bias in favor of. So the advice that they're getting isn't, isn't uncluttered. And, and so even like, how do you give a reference to somebody properly the ethics of that, you know, in, in the real world, HR departments have increasingly just said, we say we, the person is eligible for rehire or is not. And that's the end of their conversation because they're afraid of everything else that comes along. Well, it's less clean in politics, but that's the kind of little things that bump in here all the time. So, so giving candidates the tools to understand what it, what, how to ask questions, who to ask questions from and get the advice is one. Uh, how, um, how money is raised is an important thing. We actually have a lot of rules in this country on how money's raised. You can't raise money in a federal office building, for example. There's a lot of other things. Like I think we can look at that, but I think again, you have to be careful. Like you're not, you don't want to eliminate the ability of a Jamie Harrison to be a candidate because you've tightened these rules so tightly. So there's a lot of pieces that come in here, but 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 giving people tools to ask questions to clean up bad actors is a start. Which is, this is great. You've answered a question that came up in the chat about how candidates and campaign staff get their campaign training. And it sounds like AAPC does that. Uh, Dan, you do that. I know campaigns and elections and others do that as well. And here at GW, we try to do that. So that's a good start and talking about it's a good start. But now I want to focus the conversation even further since we didn't solve the money and politics problem. Let's go to something simple online. Uh, Sydney said she gives money through Act Blue, which is a digital service. We've talked about unsavory online actors. Um, Pandora is an online service. You can do micro-targeting. A lot of people who registered for this event raised lots of flags about micro-targeting, list selling, list sharing, and then in fundraising, the holy cow, the house is on fire piece. Uh, when we met a couple of days ago to have a, a pre-conversation about this, I got back-to-back -back emails from Speaker Pelosi and Donald Trump Jr. 
And between them, um, we were only $15 plus a 500% match away from saving the world or dooming democracy. I, I forget how the math went, but they were both very concerned that my dollar mattered a lot. I wanna talk about the online campaigning a bit. Let's start with um, what's on everybody's mind and that's micro-targeting. How much targeting can we do? How is, how, when do you cross a line? How much of this stuff is new? Unpack the ethics of, of online campaigning, specifically micro-targeting, if you would. Well, targeting is nothing new. Um, uh, you know, the first campaign I walked precincts for, George McGovern in 1972 was doing, even though we were using three by five cards, uh, it, it was targeted. We were going to certain neighborhoods to talk to voters. Um, certain neighborhoods got get out the vote um materials um we went to plant gates to try to remind people to vote not to the wealthy republican neighborhoods um and uh yes there is a lot more information um available about people um now but uh it, targeting has always existed because most campaigns don't have the money to talk to every voter and so you want to talk to the people who are persuadable, um, uh, the people who are always going to be against you. It's just a waste of money. Um, of course, everybody sees ads on TV and and radio, but um, uh, I don't I don't really think targeting um, uh, is a new technique. It's just refined and there's more data available. Um, Go ahead, Sydney. Go ahead, please. I'm gonna go ahead and jump in here. Yeah. Uh, I I think that even though targeting has been around for a while, it's naive to say that targeting that was around even 20 years ago is the same as targeting now. There's a new market for it. Uh, just look at Cambridge Analytica. There's a different method to the targeting that's happening. I feel like in-person targeting the stuff that you're doing rose when you're talking to the people and you're trying to convince them hey vote for this person this is why you should vote for this person there's autonomy in that decision making process there's an interaction going on between two humans but when you log on to facebook and you see that all of your friends or all of your community what have you has one view about a certain topic there's not autonomy in that decision-making process. It's uh, almost a uh, feeding tube directly into whatever decision you're going to be making. And not only is it a feeding tube into the decision-making process, but on the back end, it's a money-making process. I mean, it has become a priority for campaigns to be able to have the funds to do this type of targeting. It's, I mean, the Trump campaigns database was one of their top priorities. It's, I mean, one of the things that led to such success for them. So I don't think that we can look at the targeting that happened 20 years ago, anywhere near the same as the targeting that happened now. The ethics of it, I think are even different because of the different autonomy and the decision-making processes. So I think one of the dangers here is there's two things being brought together. Um, and Because you're uh, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, so correct me. But but the algorithm oh, I can put words in your mouth. But uh, the the algorithms that run through a lot of the social media platforms are not controlled by campaigns, right? They're controlled by those platforms that are trying to get people addicted. What campaign professionals do is say, "This is the world, therefore I will interact with it as it is." Now, so so this is the challenge that consultants have, which is. Do I choose not to use some of these things? Now, they do then feed into it and try and build uh, build their own networks in that and, that, and that's true. So I think you have to, th th there's a couple different pieces that are crossing together there. And the real question is, you know, part of the problem of, well, uh, that is it, two different things. Is it, should a consultant running for the nomination of one party be required to talk to the other party's voters? And we kind of say, you can talk to whoever you want is our generic presumption. And therefore the campaign then tries to make a smart decision. You know, this is what's in conflict here. And this is why when 
political professionals start hearing this, it's like, Facebook is not something we control. We control that we're picking the people who have coded themselves as, you know, fishing, wanting fishing licenses or whatever their particular thing is. Okay, so I want to talk then about the targeting piece and then um, and the messaging, um, and and then come to a question we had in the chat. I'm going to build a little bit of bridge here. Stay with me. This does make sense. And and to Rose's point, targeting goes back even further than George McGovern. I mean, Aristotle said you've got to figure out the people you need to persuade, and and talk to them in terms they understand. I'm contractually obligated to mention Aristotle every event, so check in that box. One of the messages that gets put out, you want to talk to your voters, right? And you don't, as a campaign guy, you don't want everybody to vote. You want all of your supporters to vote. Uh, you just need to get more votes than the other person. Is it okay to push messages online, on phones, direct mail, or elsewhere that discourages voting by people likely to vote for the other candidate? No, no. Right, you, 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 the, the, the wrinkle though is in the reality. And, and so I'm gonna stand up a little bit for reality here, which is um, it is wrong to say, I am going to put a message out that will say, this group should not vote, should not participate or intimidate them to not vote. That is flat out wrong. Um, but by the very nature of an ad that says, you know, I'm candidate A and, you know, candidate B has these flaws, there are people who've alleged, I don't think it's actually that true, but they've alleged that the mere fact that you're running a negative campaign against someone is going to drive down turnout. In fact, negative campaigns drive up turnout, but People don't want to believe empirical evidence, but um, the but the act of running that ad can have side effects of saying, "Well, I'm going to you know not vote for that state senate position because I think both candidates are equally corrupt." If that's affecting one party more than the other, you know, but the candidate people are still voting for the offices above or below. You know, the specifics really matter, and that's where grappling with the specifics is the hard part of this. Let me give you a specific instance. This has happened several times. We're not going to, I'm not going to mention campaign names, but you've got um, a member of one party who's got the nomination. The other party has a field of a variety of candidates, one of whom the Democrat wants to run against. There's a bunch of Republicans. The Democrat wants to get one against run of them, one of them. Should the Democrat, is it okay for the Democrat to quietly campaign for her preferred opponent? So you're not decreasing turnout, but you're messing in the other guy's sandbox. Well, so that's happened a lot, and I'll plead yeah. guilty to having done it. Um, uh, we uh, won't go into the details, but anyway, it was it was in the '90s. Um, anyway, um, going to one party and saying, you know, you know, if, if you're a candidate or a party or an IE group, and you say there's six or five, however many fingers I can hold up, there's two candidates. <laughs> This is one I don't want to face. I'm going to engage. I'm going to either run negative ads on this one, hoping that they lose their party's nomination, or I'm going to run pro ads for the other one, or I'm going to attack that other one, and the ideologues in the other party will see that I'm attacking them and therefore rally around them. That's done a lot. I, do, I actually don't believe that's unethical because these are all candidates. This is all communication that's being done in the public arena. It, the what's happened now which is also healthy, is that voters have a real good BS detector and everybody's now looking for this. And the party that comes in to try to play the games, you know, one party that now is the majority party in the US Senate got caught a couple of times and it hurt them, their intervention when they tried to do this, this cycle, although it had been successful in previous cycles. So, you know, th this is something that Getting more information to the people is a big part of the solution. Rose, what do you think? Well, I agree with Dan that it's a field of candidates and you want to prevail over all of them. Um, uh, and it is very common to, uh, 
in a primary um, situation um, to get out all of your negative research on the on the candidate that would be the toughest um, uh, to face um, because you whether you eliminate them in the primary or have to face them in the general uh, you're going to go after them um, uh, so I and I agree it's all in the public realm um, as long as it's factual advertising, uh, I don't have a problem with it. Sydney, what do you think? But how often is it factual advertising? Um, I think that as long as the ads are encouraging people to vote, no matter which way they're encouraging people to vote, that's okay. Um, the Where I draw the line is when you're encouraging people not to vote. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in the more people that vote, the stronger our democracy will be. So that's where I stand on that issue. But I also think just overall, we need to make it okay to be ethical. Right now, it is not okay to be ethical. Like Dan was saying, you, if a candidate has a question or doesn't know necessarily how to handle a situation and the people that they turn to right now are not going to be rewarded by making the ethical decision all the time. It's just not the way the system works. So I think there are difficult decisions to make when you're looking at information you have on a candidate of the opposite party and you know that you could run that ad and you know that you could have a really great turnout because of the ad that you ran, but you have to look at the long-term game that you're playing. Um, Again, I'll, I'll go back to the, the race that I know best, Jamie Harrison in South Carolina. He ran a few negative ads, but he tried to keep his campaign pretty clean. And as a result, he did not win. I don't think that's the complete reason for him not winning whatsoever. But I do think that you've seen time and time again, just in general, when people don't run negative ads when people try and play the good guy and keep it upbeat, aside from the recent Biden campaign, when people try and keep it upbeat, they lose. It's not something that is always rewarded. Dan, please. please <laughs> no, no, no. Well, well for, first I want to say, uh, um, as, I, as I joked before, I, I, up until about two years ago, I used to think of myself as a young Turk in politics, and now I realize I'm an old fogey. Um, so I, I love how you, the perspective you bring on some of this stuff. And I think it's, it's very valuable and accurate in a lot of ways. And, and I think it's illuminating because so here's, here's how I look at it in the campaign. Now, I wasn't involved in South Carolina, so I can't speak. To, so everything I'm going to say, I'm just making up based on how I think campaigns work. If you are uh, the Lindsey Graham campaign, you don't focus on what Jamie Harrison's saying. You focus on the totality of the other side. So whatever, and like I said, I don't know the races. So whatever you believe the kind of race Jamie Harrison ran, I'm sure the Senate Majority PAC, Chuck Schumer's Super PAC, I'm sure there were IEs, there were people who wanted to go get Lindsey Graham, blah, 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 Lincoln Project, blah, blah, blah. So if you're Lindsey Graham's side, you're, you're not looking at Jamie Harrison, you're looking at the totality of the barrage against you. And you need to engage that barrage. And one of the frustrating, so, so this create, and, and what's fascinating, the other piece is that voters don't look at it as candidate on candidate anymore either. This has been a big transformation from 15 years ago. Now candidates think it's side A and side B. So if any group comes in thinking they're being clever and they're doing something that the candidate wouldn't do, the voters are going to hold so the whole the tribe that should be held accountable for that ad accountable in spite of it. And, and we've seen that in a lot of campaigns. So this is the this is the decision making that goes on in campaigns, which goes to our point of ethics, which is how when you're in this bunker and you're seeing this totality of the attack, you, you need to hurt your opponent's favorable and unfavorable rating in the context of this maelstrom that's out there. And also I agree with what Dan's saying, but I would also say that most campaigns start with research. Um, you do comprehensive research on yourself, 
and opposition research. And then you do survey research, polling, focus groups, online testing. Um, uh, what you put in that research is very important uh, to the ads you end up running. And I've been in many campaigns where I say, no, we're not gonna test that. We'd never do that. That's just out of bounds. And uh, they're like, no, it could really work. It could really work. Well, no, let's just take it off the table right now so that we don't get numbers saying it moves us 10 points. And then we have this ethical uh, conversation down the road um, or in the final days, as Dan was saying. Um, uh, but the reason campaigns use negative ads is that they're often the only path to victory. Again, I've been in many campaigns where we were desperate to run a positive message because the incumbent was so proud of his accomplishments uh, and voters just didn't believe it, didn't believe he had done those things. The negative against the other guy was believable and actually changed their, their opinions of the two candidates. Um, and so many challengers uh, are unknown to the electorate. And if you don't tell the, the voters the downside of that challenger who's challenging your guy, uh, uh, they'll, they're not gonna find it out. Um, so when, as elections are a choice for voters, it's our job to define that choice. And, and add to that, so, so the voters get a big voice in this process. One of the incredibly frustrating things is Given the choice of do they believe a negative ad or a positive ad, the voters choose the negative ad every time. They are more suspicious and cynical about positive claims than negative claims. Makes it very hard to communicate. You see it all the time in focus groups. You say a candidate, you know, saved a drowning person. They're like, yeah, there was probably only a foot of water. I mean, they push back hard. So does that mean that we have to run negative ads or does that mean we have to change the perception of the voters? Awesome question. And this is the problem of the campaign and the consultant. And you said long-term before in one of your other responses, the campaign's objective is to get to election day. <laughs> and, and, and that creates all sorts of dangerous short-term incentives. It is incredibly hard. There have been leaders who have done it to change the voters' reactions to stuff, but human nature is much more powerful than any of the silly stuff we engage in in politics. All right, so I'm gonna artificially cut off a robust and interesting conversation with an eye to the clock. Um, opposition research, negative ads is another topic we could explore for over an hour. There's a chapter on it in the ethics book, as I said, written by somebody who did opposition research for, for the Rubio campaign, and we've all been in that position. Um, Dan and Rose is California people, you'll appreciate that after I ran a congressional campaign out there in the 90s in, the, in San Fernando Valley, and the opposition campaign manager and I would, would talk periodically. And we got together a couple of days after the election and shared the oppo on each other we didn't use, which was kind of a fun exercise. Um, here's a couple of things. I, I, rather than, here's a couple of things that they jump out at me and that I've seen in the chat. One is we still haven't answered the question, how do we fix it? We've, we've talked about how we make it better, have more of these conversations, have more trainings, have more discussions, right? So let this come up in the chat that's really out of, out of consultant's control is the role of local media. Rose, you said, you know, the press used to hold people in line. Now there's a demise of local media. That's harder to do. That may be part of the solution. But I am still struck with, other than just continuing to hire Rose, Dan, and Sydney exclusively, how do we make political campaigns better and then how do we get to a lot of the other conversations people wanted to have in, in the chat? Um, do you have any, any quick last minute thoughts before we let people to go in the remaining sort of 90 seconds or so? Rose, Dan, Sydney? The practicality of doing this is important. It's one of the reasons why I'm like a big believer in dragging these conversations out in the open. I've had a lot of people just in the advertising for this start joking with me, people I know about, ha, 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 you can't solve this problem. And I go back and forth with them. And about the fourth email, they're like, yeah, there's a lot of bad things that we need to do it. So just dragging this topic out into the open, because the last part I'd say is 
Look at pop culture. Who does pop culture think is a great media consultant? It's the meanest, vicious, nastiest, you know, growling curmudgeons that they can find, whether they're Hollywood pictures or talking heads on CNN and Fox News. Rose, what do you think? Uh, yeah, thoughts? I agree with that. I think uh, we just need to talk about it more. We need to incorporate it into training for campaign managers, consultants, which we're already doing, but we could do more. Um, and then I think the candidates um, also need to be more engaged. Um, I wish I could wave a magic wand and bring back uh, a robust local press uh, as watchdogs, but uh, I just don't think that's happening. Sydney, you're the one with the political career in front of you. Last thoughts? <laughs> oh, goodness. That's only my major. Let's not jump to the career. Oh, so <laughs> your fallback position is a PhD in philosophy? <laughs> the world may never know. But um, <laughs> I'm going to bring in the aspect of the people here because uh, I know this might sound naive, but they are the ones who vote. Um, a lot of people don't have the civic education of this is what to value in a candidate. And that's aside from policy content, but just in terms of what the candidate believes. Um, and I think this can happen on a lot of different levels. And I know it, it's not the realm that anybody on this call participates in, but in the local and younger education levels of what is civics in the first place, because we're even seeing Jin Saki now give civic lessons from the White House. But what is civics and what are values? And regardless of party, regardless of political belief, those are things that we can all agree on. And the number one thing that we have to do to solve this problem is find common ground in the first place. Nothing's going to be accomplished by pointing fingers constantly. So I think we have to point no more fingers, but find some common ground on what we agree to be a civil debate in the first place. And then we can start to have candidates that believe in that civil debate. Fantastic. Great way to, great way to end. And David Welch, who's on the call, runs the Subbo Field Institute, would certainly agree with you. Jeff Harris, who is with us and has worked on this for his whole career, I know would agree with you. Um, a lot of good work to be done, a lot of good people doing work. Thank you. Rose, Dan, Sydney, for taking the time. Uh, thank all of you for taking time out of a, a busy, busy Thursday evening. Uh, I'll send a follow-up email. There'll be links to the AAPC, links to some other stuff. We'll get you involved in other events. We'll pursue the other questions people had in the chat and, and when they signed up. And, you know, there's a lot of good work to be done. So go forth and do it. Thank you all. Have a good night.